Well, good morning, everyone. Our subject set by the elders is uh, walking in the light, continuing on what uh, we began with last, last week. So let's again please turn to the uh, first John uh, chapter one. First John chapter one, walking in the light. We're going to be looking at quite a few scriptures this morning because the scriptures uh, explain things uh, much better than what I can. We'll seek to comment on them. That which was from the beginning, and that speaks of the eternal being, he always was eternally the son of God. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. This is a message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light. That's a wonderful statement, isn't it? God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So when God created the light and caused it to shine out of the darkness, uh, he separated the day from the night and it also has a spiritual implication. It's an illustration. Of, of spiritual light and, and spiritual darkness, as we'll notice as we go further down. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Of course, darkness really is living our self-centered life uh, and it's uh, darkness is living in sin. If we say that we have fellowship with and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, I've, I have said, I think, before here that if we stand under a light, we don't, under the light, if it's a, a light in the room and we stand under it, we don't throw any shadows, do we? But the further we move away from that light, the longer our shadow becomes. And of course, this relates to our fellowship with one another. As we walk in the light in fellowship with the Lord Jesus, we have fellowship with one another. And we're not causing a problem to one another. Verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. And we'll go down to chapter 2 and down to verse 8. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause of stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. That's a very, very interesting reading. Now, can you turn with me back to the book of Isaiah, please, in the Old Testament, chapter 9? And we have the prophet Isaiah foretelling the light that would come into the world and shine into the darkness. And so the light is foretold and it would be manifested in Galilee of the Gentiles. So in chapter 9... We read uh, read in verse 1. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed, as when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward more heavily oppressed her. 
by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan in Galilee of the Gentiles. Now, Galilee was the point where the armies of, of the Assyrians and the armies of the Babylonians came in and, and oppressed Israel and, of course, led them into captivity. And uh, Galilee was where many of Alexander the Great's soldiers settled. And so it had a Greek influence. And that is why the Galileans were looked looked down upon by the Hebrew. Paul said, I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He wasn't a Galilean. And of course, Peter, he was a Galilean. And they, there was a saying that uh, no one could swear like a, a Galilean fisherman. I was only reading in Mark's gospel this morning in my devotional time where Peter uh, denied the Lord with oaths and curses. Can you imagine that? You know, that gives me great encouragement because when I sin and fail the Lord, if Peter could find forgiveness for that and, and Paul for putting Christians to death, well, there's hope for me, isn't there? We'll look at that as we go on. What encouragement we learn from the failure of, us, of others and it helps us to put our, our failures in the light of God's word and realize that we can have forgiveness. And so um, we, I'd like you to read verse two. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has, sh has shined. And of course, this is where the Lord began his ministry. The light of the world, the Lord Jesus, came into this world and he began his ministry in, uh, in Galilee of the Gentiles. Now, if we can turn over, please, to John's Gospel, chapter 1. John's Gospel, chapter 1 particularly verses four and five, but just for the sake of context, let's read it from the beginning. In the beginning was, here we have that little word was again. In the, in the beginning was the word, his eternal pre-existence. He always was and is and always will be. He is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and, com and the darkness did not comprehend it. It didn't apprehend it. It didn't accept it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. Now, have you ever thought about how he gives light? He certainly gives life to us. We all have life through him. Without him, there would be no life. He is the light of life. So he gives us life. But I think he gives light to every man who comes into the world. There's no excuse. The heavens declare the, the glory of God. That's light. God is shining a light on his creation. I was just listening to the ladies singing. How beautiful to hear their voices, isn't it? You know, how remarkable is his creation? They're beautiful voices. We, we guys have a much lower voice, generally speaking. God's creation, whether it's in the things seen around us or in our own body, is just absolutely remarkable. So he's given us life and in that and with it light and understanding. I believe he's given us an understanding. Everybody has an understanding. Everybody has a conscience. There's a little inner voice. There's light. God has light, shone light into our very being so that we are without excuse. So he gives light to every man who uh, coming into the world. Of course, the light was fully revealed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice verse 14 of chapter 1. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The glory. To me, it speaks of the Shekinah glory. The glory of God was upon the tabernacle. Remember how it came down when Moses erected it? And God's glory came down upon it when Solomon built the temple. The glory of the Lord came down upon it and the priests were not able to minister there, but the glory was so great. And as Moses spent time before the Lord, his face shone. He was reflecting that glory, a glory which the children of Israel could not look upon. He had to put a, 
a veil over his face. And we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 that that veil is still upon the hearts of the Jewish people. And they cannot look beyond to see the glory of Christ. They are blinded. They are spiritually blinded. And as are many of the Gentiles today. The word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. And how, how was that glory revealed in the person of Christ? Two words, grace and truth. Isn't that what has attracted us? The grace of God that brings salvation. It's been revealed to us and we've entered into the good of it. And what about truth? As I was meditating on this this morning, this, just one thing came to me, and again it was in my reading, where the high priest said to, to, to the Lord Jesus, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? He could not de deny himself. What did he say? I am. He could not deny himself. There's truth shining through, absolute truth. I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So when we think of light, when we think of life, when we think of Christ, it's all centered in him and it shines forth, manifested in this world through grace and through truth. And that's how we can be. We are told to be a light in this world, aren't we? He sent us forth to be a light. And how can our light shine? It can shine through grace and through truth. Did you read the Daily Bread, any of you this, this morning? Uh, this guy, and it happened to my son too, and he did the same thing. Uh, somebody dumped rubbish on the farm. And this fellow did a circle around the farm and uh, found this rubbish. And the, he, it had been going on for a while, the Daily Bread mentions. It happened to my son actually on the farm. So he picked it up. This guy picked it up and found a letter with the address of the guy on it. So he went back that night and dumped it all and his as well in the, in the fellow's yard. <laughs> my son did that but it was a lesson of grace my son didn't learn the lesson he was chuckling over it he didn't have any more more trouble but what grace you know when things happen to us that we can easily react can't we against it and get our own back but grace and truth is how we are to be manifested in this life and boy that's a hard lesson to learn it's taken me a long time to learn and i'm still learning I don't know whether you've arrived yet. I'd like to meet you. Put your hand up if you've arrived. Paul said, I haven't yet arrived. <laughs> he said, I'm still reaching out for the high point, that high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He was striving towards that mark, unattainable in one sense, because we are human. And yet that's the mark. We don't, we don't aim lower, we aim for the very highest mark, and that is Christ himself, the glory of Christ. That's to be our aim, to glorify him in our bodies here below. Now, if we go over to chapter 3, we have more about that light. Verse uh, 16 we know by heart, don't we? Oh, we'll read it again. I'm using the New King James. Verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, and that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. And that's what happens when we accept the Lord Jesus, our Savior. We come to the light and we... we we, we just want to be revealed before the Lord. We come to that point where we recognize our sinfulness and our utter helplessness in the sight of God and our need totally of his forgiveness and salvation, which is of no, nothing good in us to achieve it, to, to, to earn it or to be rewarded by it. But it's all of grace and we come to him in confession, confessing our sin. And we're, we've come to the light. We don't want to hide anything. You know, I think it's Psalm 139, David says, where can I flee from your presence?
and keep near it. And so um, um, these, there are those who reject the light. What is light? Men love this. Men love darkness rather than light. You know, I've, I've, I've mixed with them out there in recent years at the men's shed at Wemuran and here at uh, Bean Lee. And men love darkness rather than light. They don't want to talk to me about the light, the light of the world. They want to talk about other things and often very, very improper things for a Christian to even listen to. And so before we can come, before we can walk in the light, we must come to the light. We can't walk in the light. We can't be a pretend Christian and say that we're walking with the Lord if we've never come to him, if we've never seen our need of him, if we've never come in brokenness of spirit, if we've never come confessing our sins and realizing that the Lord Jesus died for our sins on the cross, that was the whole purpose of his coming into this world. And if we've never come to that point in our life where we've really got down on our knees and cried out to God for forgiveness and for, for, the, for mercy from above, to forgive us our sins, uh, if we've never done that, you know, I think one of the sad things is that it's possible for particularly those in Christian families, kids in Christian families can put their hand up for Jesus in a moment to join the crowd we used to have a brother visit us many years ago in Bariba, and he, he always got a lot of kids saved in the Sunday school. But I wonder whether they were saved. You know, we can work the crowd up a bit, can't we? Particularly children. But we need a divine work done in our lives. With the Spirit of God, the, the heart is spoken of as being like a rock. And it's like bedrock. It's like plowing a field. When I was just a young teenager, I helped my brother's when they drew irrigation blocks out at Mara, and that soil was hard pan. I ploughed with a Fergie tractor for days and hardly got anywhere. The plough kept riding out of the ground. It was so hard, and human hearts are like that. And we're told to break up the, the fallow ground, break up the hard ground, the bedrock of our of our, our wickedness of our hearts. It needs to be broken up by the power of the divine spirit of God, bringing in, bringing conviction and bringing us to that point where we get down on our knees and cry to, to God for forgiveness. Then we've come to the light. We've opened up our lives so that we, we don't want anything hidden from the Lord. We want him to see the very inner recesses. We're not keeping any areas of our heart hidden from him, any rooms where he can't have access. We want the whole of our heart, the whole of our life to be open before the Lord so that his light can shine in and he keeps shining in and he keeps revealing things so that we can say, Lord, now I can see that more clearly. I need to confess that. I need to put that right. I thank God has given me a few more years in my old age because I'm still working on it. I'll touch that towards the close. So before we can walk in the light, we must come to the light in brokenness of spirit, confessing our sin and taking Christ as Saviour. And then we need to realise with whom we have to do. Who, do we, who are we dealing with? We're dealing with, with the Lord, with God himself. I won't turn to these scriptures, but Hebrews 12 verse 29 says, For our God is a consuming fire. That's the, the Shekinah glory. It's a consuming fire. You can't approach that light other than through Christ, who is the light of the world. You can only approach through him. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. We can only approach that unapproachable light. It's called that also in the scriptures. For it says in Hebrews 12, 20, uh, sorry, in 1 Timothy 6, 16, that he is dwelling in unapproachable light. That's where God dwells. It's unapproachable. We just can't get in there. Some people say, well, I, I live the best life I can. Um, you know, I've got to weigh up my good. I hope, you know, if there is a God, he'll weigh up the good I've done. I, and uh, I try to do unto others uh, as I would have them do unto me, the golden rule. And somehow I weigh up my good against my bad. And I hope it balances in my favor. Well, it just doesn't work that way. God is unapproachable. And the only way of approach is through the Lord Jesus. And that's why there is a mediator. Timothy, Paul writes to Timothy, there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And it was Job who said, oh, if only there was a mediator. What was Job longing for as he went through those times of great distress? 
He was longing for someone to lay their hand on God and their hand on him and bring them together. And that's exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ does. He is the one mediator, the only mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, the one the, who came into the world in, as a human being, God manifest in flesh, that he might reveal the heart of the Father. He could say, he that has seen me has seen the Father. And as we read through the Gospels, we're getting insight into the heart of the Father because we're seeing the life of Christ revealed revealed in his ministry, revealed in his healing, revealed in his words. God is being manifested and made known to us through the written word. Thank God for that, how wondrously it's been preserved to us. The most precious thing that we have in, in this life is, is the word of God. It's the, it's the most wonderful thing. So we have to do with him. We have to do with a, a God who is a consuming fire, who is dwelling in unapproachable life, and yet we can approach him through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he's called our saviour. He's called the saviour of the world. The only way, the only way to him. And so uh, John 8, if we go to John 8, we have the very interesting uh, very interesting account of the woman taken in adultery. And we're not going to read that. And I'm absolutely sure that it is part of the word of God. And the Lord said to her in verse 10, woman, where are those, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord. Here's, here's a change in her heart. She's calling him Lord. And in the book of Romans, I think it is, we, no one can call him or is it Corinthians? No one can call him Lord but by the Holy Spirit. If we, if he's truly Lord, he's Lord of all. That's the word kurios. It means he's Lord of all. He's sovereign Lord over my life. That's what we need. A sovereign Lord over us that we have, we have submitted to. We've laid down the arms of rebellion. And we're looking to him. We have his word to guide us and we're trusting in him. And so then it says, and I believe this flows on, then Jesus spoke to them, and here's the crowd surrounding that had seen this. He'd written on the ground. He'd written on the ground. It'd be interesting to know what he wrote there, wouldn't it? But we're not told. And we shouldn't speculate. You know, where the word is silent, let's be silent too. We shouldn't be speculating about issues that probably don't really matter in the long term. And so... Uh, he spoke to them again saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Now that woman had been walking in darkness. By the, by the way, no doubt you've heard a question asked, where was the man? Where was the man? How come they dragged her up there? Where was the man? Maybe he was one of them, eh? Maybe he got off because they had some way around it through their laws, I don't know. That's speculation. I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So what is, what is, uh, what is darkness? Well, it's been defined that darkness is the absence of light. This thing is uh, dropping out again, Richard. Myself a bit. How's that? <laughs> Alan. and uh, light is traveling at around 300,000 kilometers a second and that's around seven times around the earth I think every second more than second seven times around the earth every second and we can measure light it's possible to have a light meter you can even break it up into its various colors the prisms of light and they can measure the speed of light and the amount of light can be measured but darkness is just the absence of light. You can measure the absence of light growing into darkness, less light, less light, but darkness, you can't measure darkness. It's the absence of light. It reminds me of the, the terrible depth of sin and the, the uh, 
the awfulness of sin, the depths of sin. He brought me out, out, out of the horrible pit, out of the miry clay. This poor man cried to the Lord and he heard him. And he delivered him out of the pit, out of the miry clay. And it's been suggested that that is one of those cisterns where they dug into the earth, into the rock to hold water and came into disuse. And if you fell into it, there was no way out and it would have accumulated muck and mire in the bottom and you'd be stuck there unless somebody could take you out. And he delivered me out of the miry clay. And he put a new song in my mouth, even praise to the Lord. And that's what God does. He delivers us out of the pit of darkness. You think of the awfulness of a lost soul going into all eternity without Christ, into the blackness of darkness forever, absence of light. Hell must be a terrible place. And so we have come to the Lord Jesus. We have come to the one. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Now, I'd like you to turn over to a beautiful little uh, few verses in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Actually, we'll have a look at, uh, on the way, at 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and then I think it might be chapter 5 that we, we want. A little verse here in First Corinthians, verse 5 of chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. Then each one, each one's praise will come from God. That's an interesting verse, isn't it? It's speaking of a, of a coming day, and I think it's pointing on to the judgment seat of Christ. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. Then each one's praise will come from God. That's a very interesting verse, isn't it? And then if we go over to 2 Corinthians, chapter 4, and I just love this section, verse 3 of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, remember the veil in, in chapter 3 is on the heart of, the, of those who do not believe the gospel. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Isn't that a beautiful section of God's word? And so we need to gaze on the face of the Lord Jesus and the gospel brings this out. It's the gospel of the glory of God. What is the gospel? Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried. He rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the simple message of the gospel. And how that holds the thought of his death, his burial, and his resurrection, and the glorious victory that is ours through what he has accomplished. And so we can see that in, in the gospel, we can see the beauty of our Lord Jesus Christ shining in the face of Jesus Christ. That's the one that we've come to. It's a transforming light. It's the gospel of the glory of God. Of course, the gospel is the power of God and the salvation. It's all wrapped up in this thought. It's glorifying Christ in what he's done for us in coming into this world through his death, burial, and resurrection. Of course, his ascension to the right hand of the majesty on high. And he ever lives to make intercession for his people. A little saying that I learned many years ago, I don't know if you've heard it, but 
This is it. It's light received increases light. Light rejected bringeth night. Who will give the will to choose if the love of light we lose? That's important, isn't it? You might like to memorize it. Light received increases light. So the Lord said, the one who has more will be given to him. And if we don't seek this light, it'll, we'll lose. We'll begin to lose it. And so in our Christian walk, we must keep seeking the Lord. We must keep spending time in the word. And the more light we have, it, God will increase the light. Light received increases light. Light rejected bringeth night. Who will give the will to choose if the love of light we lose? And a little, a little statement just on First John, first chapter. Where there is life, there will be righteousness. Now we receive life through the indwelling spirit, and he's the Holy Spirit. And where the Holy Spirit dwells, he wants righteousness to dwell. And that's in our lives. So where there is life, the life of Christ in us, through the Holy Spirit indwelling, there will be righteousness. And where there is light, there, there will be love. And um, tribulation work of patience, patience experience, experience, hope. And hope not, makes not ashamed. Why? Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts through the Holy Spirit, which is given to us. So where there is a light, the light of God's word shining, telling us that we are to love one another. Jesus said, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That's not for the ones. Some of us are more lovely than others. Some of us have lovely little personalities. I wish I had some of the lovely personalities of my brothers. I'd go around and pick out what I would like. But uh, God's made us all differently and we're to love one another with our little differences of, of personality, our little uh, uh, funny little ways that some of us have, don't we? And so we are to love one another with a pure heart, it says, fervently, a fervent love. I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, it's in chapter 5. We've already looked at that verse in chapter four. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes who will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the heart. Then each one's praise will come from God. And when we go over to chapter five, verse 10, Second Corinthians, isn't it? It's Second Corinthians chapter five. Sorry about that. Verse 11, therefore knowing the terror of all, verse 10, verse 10 of chapter five of Second Corinthians, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. That's an interesting verse. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well known to God and I also trust are well known in your conscience. So it's dealing with the judgment seat of Christ where uh, verse 11 says, verse 11, verse, verse 10, it's according to what he has done, whether good or bad. That's how we will be judged. I made a few notes on this here. He will bring to he will bring the thin hidden things of darkness to light. And so I've made a few a little list. What will he reveal? He will reveal any unconfessed sin. I think that's one of the things. Thank God for confession that we can spend time. We're told to do that before we remember the Lord. We're to search our heart. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We're to judge ourselves before we partake of the Lord's Supper. So that if there's anything there, and we're conscious, if you've got the Holy Spirit, the moment you do something wrong, you'll know, and you'll get no rest until you go and ask the person's forgiveness or until you uh, ask the Lord's forgiveness as well. And so he's going to bring the hidden things of darkness to light. He will reveal unconfessed sin. Sin is very deceitful, very deceitful. 
Who can know the heart, the Lord says, it is deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. That's the human heart that we have. Who can know it? Only God knows it. And he searches the heart. So what does he search? He searches out our attitudes, our self-centeredness, our, our wrong attitudes, our wrong motives. He searches the heart. We read in 1 Corinthians that uh, he will bring the, bring the hidden things of darkness to light. That's the motives. We can't judge one another's motives. God knows our motives. He knows why we want to serve him and what's behind all of our reasoning and thinking and what we're on about. He judges that. Wrong attitudes, wrong mot motives. It can be deceitfulness. We can have carryovers from our childhood where we learn little things of deceitfulness. Uh, deeds done for self-adulation, a little bit of the limelight for the praise of men. And so all this is of the flesh and any of that that we have not judged, the Lord will judge. And so we need to check for these. We need a checklist. And uh, the old saying is we must keep short accounts with God. Keep the books up to date. Everything, everything registered and everything right. Sin hinders prayer. Remember that it can hinder us in our walk. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Psalm 66, 18. James says, you ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. So it's for self, not for the Lord. Our activities are purely self-centered. So it's very searching, isn't it? God will speak to us about our hidden self-life. He will use his word and spirit to reveal things and to bring conviction in our hearts. And thank God for that's his ministry to us. But he'll also use godly advice from fellow people believers and boy that's a bit hard to take isn't it eh? a little rebuke isn't that hard to take do you find that wow how dare anybody tell me something about my life well thank god for that faithful the, the old books the old testament says faithful are the wounds of a friend you know it's not easy i've had friends speak to me and i thank god for them as i look back it wasn't good the medicine wasn't very pleasant at the time but as I'm getting older, it's more pleasant, it's sweet to the taste. Might be bitter in the stomach, but it's sweet to the taste. And um, yes, so a, a rebuke. So we need a word in season. Thank God for that. And then we are cleansed from our sins, uh, from our sin, singular. That's First uh, John, John chapter 1. If we confess our sin, that's singular, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. As if, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the sin is the principle and the fruit of it are the sins that we commit. And the moment we confess them, they're forgiven. Can we turn to Hebrews? I'd just like to read chapter four. It's a very encouraging little few words there. The end of chapter four. Verse 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. There he is up there. He's gone through the heavens. Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need we have an advocate with the father we have the holy spirit within as an advocate interceding for us with words that cannot be uttered in in human words and terms he's interceding for us we have the great high priest at the right hand of the majesty on high and we're told to come boldly to the throne of grace it's wonderful isn't it this is grace and truth flowing from the heart of god I just want to make a little statement here. It is my firm belief that no unconfessed sin will be raised by our Lord at the judgment seat of Christ. Why? Your sins and your iniquities I will remember no more forever. That's a statement of the word of God. And I just want to read from Revelation chapter 19, verses 6 to 8. Don't turn to it. I'll just read it to you. Alleluia. For the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. Notice that. 
his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is, is the righteous acts of the saints. His wife has made herself ready. Meditating on that, you know, we're busy, but we're busy doing that now. We're making ourselves ready, each one of us. As we just review our lives and keep short accounts with God, and as we walk in the light, we're making ourselves ready. And at the judgment seat of, of, of Christ, thank God for it. Anything at all that hasn't been put right, it'll be put right there. Isn't that wonderful? His wife has made herself ready. And he will put the finishing touches. And in the glory, we're going to be seen in those beautiful, pure white robes. The righteousness, the righteous acts of the saints. We're going to be robed in glory and we're going to be with him forevermore.